Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm James Fibris, Chairman of the British Yemeni Society. At this meeting, we will hear Professor Clive Jones talking about David Smiley under his somewhat cryptic title of The Real Smiley. This event is shared with the Anglo Amani Society. Welcome to those participants. I understand Clive has also invited students from his department at Durham, so welcome to you too. And we hope you'll all feel free to join the QA at the end. One of the British Yemeni Society's key activities is to organize these events with COVID-19 and the rise of Zoom. We have the opportunity to re reach a much wider audience than our usual physical meetings. Our plan is to arrange talks across a wide range of themes relating to Yemen, history, politics, culture and humanitarian, but also less well covered themes such as gender, economics and the environment. Clive's talk will throw some light on a poorly understood and less publicized period of history for both Yemen and Oman. These events took place over 30, 50 years ago. But there are a number of parallels to Yemen's current situation and to a lesser extent Oman's, which we can explore in the Q&A, such as the role of the intervention and manipulations of both regional and world powers, especially through the supply of arms and troops, with little thought to the consequences for Yemeni lives and livelihoods but also the shifting nature of those alliances over time, the strategy of building relations with tribes, the tactic of giving support to your enemy's enemy, or at least to tie down an enemy's resources, the role of mercenaries paid by one of these external players to advance their agenda, and the context of an unwinnable and drawn out war. We should keep in mind the ongoing relation between those terrible triplets of war, displacement and famine, and the context that 50 years ago, both Yemen and Oman's populations were largely impoverished and famine is not infrequent. Clive Jones will be known to many of you, but just a few highlights. He's Professor of Regional Security for the Middle East at Durham University. He's written numerous books, including on Britain in Yemen's civil war, on Britain and state formation in Arabia, on Britain's departure from Aden with Noel Briony, a former uh, chairman of the OAS. And most recently, he's written on Israel and the Gulf Monarchies, a highly topical subject. And last year, he published The Clandestine Lives of Colonel David Smiley, codename Grin, which is the subject of this talk. Clive will speak for about 20, 45 minutes, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Please signal your question or comment during the talk in the chat box but please keep muted and cameras off. And a reminder that this meeting will be recorded and available in due course on the BYS website. So Clive, over to you. Thank you very much for that very, very kind um, introduction. Um, first of all, um, just a brief words of, of, of thanks to uh, James Firebrace and Noel Brahoney of the British Yemeni Society and to Louise Hosking, Nick Smith, and Stuart Lang of the anglo Amani for Society for uh, allowing me to speak to you tonight and to address you on the life of uh, David Smiley. And just a brief word as well of thanks to some members of the Smiley family, in particular Zan Smiley, who I know is uh, joining us um, tonight uh, and who I owe a great deal of debt to uh, for allowing me um, access to um, family archives. Pretty good to be able to um, talk to him and to his late father about his life. And as I say, I, I, I'm, I'm deeply in debt uh, to, to Zan in, in particular. Um, just a very, very brief few words about how I came to uh, write David Smiley's biography. Um, really, it goes back to a project and later on a book that I wrote on Britain's role in the Yemen civil war between 1962 to 1965. I had done a great deal of groundwork in the National Archives in London. I'd even been out to Yemen to talk to some of the Yemenis, particularly the former foreign minister, Abdul Karim Irihani. Um, but the name Smiley kept coming up in so many documents. The hospitality industry is bracing itself for even heightened restrictions. Our North of England correspondent, Danny Savage, has been speaking to people living and working there. I've got some of these. Uh, can you all turn off your, your make sure you're muted. That's that bottom. Can you all make sure you're muted? Yeah, I keep to get rid of this one. Okay. Chaos. Okay. 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 
Now, how do you get this into big screen? Excuse all these glitches. I see there's a couple of people in the waiting room that I'm letting in. So uh, hopefully I'll keep an eye on that. Okay. Sorry, back to you, back to you, Clive. Yeah. So um, from some of the background research, it was quite clear to me that the name Smiley and indeed other names associated with uh, Britain's policy in Yemen, notably Julian Amory, Billy McLean, these were names that, that, that kept coming up. And I was lucky enough to um, track down um, David Smiley through the use of the Special Forces Club um, in London. And it's really through talking to him primarily about his time in Yemen and how he became involved first as an advisor to um, the various royalist forces uh, being paid for by the Saudis and later on taking charge of what became known as the British mercenary organization that I then became interested in his um, wider life. So that's just a, a, a brief background about the, um, how I came involved to be involved with um, David Smiley um, himself. Um, just before I go on to talk a little bit more about him, just the way I'm going to structure this, I think really to understand his time in both Oman and Yemen, you need to learn a little bit and to know a little bit about his background, his irregular, if you like, military uh, career, which I'll say a little bit um, about. Um, but I also want to challenge two things about head. David Smiley. One was by his very close friend, Alan Hare, who he served with in the Special Operations Executive um, in um, Albania. And Hare noted of, 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 of Smiley that he was very brave and he was an exceptionally brave man um, because he had no imagination. Well, he may have said that, said that a bit tongue in cheek, uh, but nonetheless, he did have imagination. And I would argue that precisely because he had Im imagination, he survived for as long as he did. Um, equally, for example, I could have called the title or could have named the book, um, The Man with Nine Lives, because he escaped death on innumerable occasions. He had severe bouts of malaria, bilharzia, and survived uh, almost uh, an attack of typhoid that would have killed uh, most people. And this is in, in, in the 1930s. He had numerous brushes with death riding horses. He walked away from numerous um, air crashes. And indeed, in his mission to uh, Siam or Thailand in 1945, he was very, very badly burnt and could clearly have died if it hadn't been for the care and attention with, 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 from the people with whom he was serving um, at the time. And I'll say briefly a little bit more about that um, in, in a moment. The other thing is in a more recent book about the Kim Philby affair, the, the, the Times journalist Ben McIntyre, when he was describing Smiley's role in training Albanian exiles to go back into Albania to try to overthrow the regime of M Enver Hoxha, and Smiley had been seconded to MI6 at that point. In his book, Ben McIntyre describes Smiley as, as slightly mad. Well, I do take exception to that uh, description. There are many uh, terms that you can use to describe Smiley, but he was not mad. He was incredibly level-headed. He was an individual who, who very much lived um, in, in, in the present. And indeed, he is a man who not only was being very brave, I think was incredibly honorable. That may be an old fashioned term to use today, particularly in, 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 in academic circles, but he was an incredibly honorable and incredibly straight man. And it's that character that I hope to bring out in tonight's talk, and certainly that character, character which I think comes out um, in the book. One final thing before I go on to talk a little bit about his early life. Um, clearly he was involved in some of the more controversial episodes of clandestine warfare in managing Britain's retreat from empire. And indeed, he, many would argue that he's the embodiment of the effectiveness or otherwise, the morality or otherwise, of trying to use special operations and indeed intelligence in trying to manage Britain's position in, in the world in an era of post-war decline. And I think there are uh, echoes and in some, in some case a resonance with what has happened today in terms of how Britain uses its uh, armed forces in trying to manage its interests in the wider world. And perhaps we can come to some of those issues um, in the Q&A session. So let's get on with the talk. So who was Colonel Smiley? Let me just 
who was who was Colonel Smiley? Well, um, he was born in London in 1916. He was the youngest of um, four children. Um, his father's side of the family, Sir John Smiley, came from um, Ulster and were fairly wealthy. They 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 had interests in cotton mills and uh, and in shipping. On his mother's side, um, the the uh, de Crepinis, his full name was David de Crepigny Smiley. The de Crepinis were originally a Huguenot family. Um, uh, and um, his great grandfather, uh, Claude de Crepigny uh, Smiley, was a noted adventurer. And you could argue that he, that David Smiley was to inherit some of the characteristics um, of his uh, grandfather on the mother's side, although his grandfather had a had a reputation of being something of uh, a pugilist. But nonetheless, it's quite clear that Smiley had a very adventurous spirit. He was educated at Hawtrey's Prep School before going on to Pangbourne, and his early desire was actually to join the uh, Royal Navy. But he never got quite the grades, as it were, to go directly as an officer entrant into the Royal Navy. And his fallback was to join the army. And he eventually uh, goes to Sandhurst in 1934. He's uh, commissioned into the Royal Horse Guards uh, in uh, 1936. And up until the outbreak of war, he lives very much ex um, a privileged uh, existence. It's often said that a posting for the household cavalry was to go south of the um, to go south of the uh, uh, Serpentine, or to or to head north to go on army manoeuvres in, um, in 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 Thetford, but when war breaks out, the, his regiment, the Royal Horse Guards, the Blues, as they were more commonly known, um, were sent uh, to Palestine, really for internal security duties. And this is not what Smiley wanted to do. He wanted to be engaged in the war. So what he then did was to volunteer to um, uh, serve with the Somaliland Camel Corps. And on his way down the Red Sea to join the Somaliland Camel Corps, he meets with a, ma a man, an individual, who was very much to shape uh, much of his irregular, if you like, clandestine life. This is a man called uh, Billy McLean, or Neil McLean, otherwise known as Billy McLean, who was serving in the uh, Royal Scots Greys. And like Smiley, he was, he was not a man who would put up with, as it were, pedestrian uh, soldiering, policing the outer regions of empire. However, before they got to Somaliland, to defend British Somaliland, it had actually fallen to the um, Italians. But nonetheless, when he got back to uh, Cairo, Smiley used his family connections. His family were well connected with the Wavell family of, of General Wavell. And he uses those connections to get a posting to the newly formed Middle East commandos. And it's with the Middle East Commandos, 52 Middle East Commando, that he gets his first taste of uh, action fighting in the campaign in um, Abyssinia. Now, once that campaign is over, he goes back to rejoin uh, his regiment, the Blues, and becomes part of uh, the uh, Allied force who go on to um, secure uh, Iraq, overthrow the uh, government, the Vichy government uh, in Syria, and later on go to ensure that British interests are protected in uh, Iran. So he's really going around uh, the outer regions, if you like, of uh, the Middle East. And again, he uh, certainly in Iraq and later on in Syria, he demonstrates um, courage in action. And indeed in an action around Palmyra in 1941, May of 1941, he is mentioned um, in dispatches. And later on, he goes back with uh, the blues in the reconnaissance role and takes part in the Battle of Al Alamein. But after the Battle of Al Alamein, um, the regiment is uh, scheduled to be posted on the border with uh, Turkey, just in case there was to be an axis thrust through uh, Turkey in the aftermath of the British and, and Empire victory at Al Alamein. This he doesn't want to do. And he looks up his old friend, Billy McLean in Cairo. Now McLean, after, after the Somaliland uh, episode, had joined up first of all with Lord Wingate's forces and fought as an irregular in Abyssinia, and later went on to work for an organization called MI9. And then he joins the Special Operations Executive or SOE in Cairo. Smiley gets in touch with him and says, look, is it a possibility that um, I could be recruited? Because I want to be in the war. I don't want to be posted, kicking my heels, 
up in the border, up in the border between Syria and Turkey. And McLean smooths his entry, therefore, into what was called um, the firm. He's, he's, he's taken on, he goes on a training course at the uh, SOE uh, training school up in uh, Haifa, in what was then uh, Palestine. He passes that, comes back to uh, Cairo. And in um, April of 1943, he is part of the uh, first mission to um, jump into Albania in 1943. As you're looking at the PowerPoint side on the left-hand side, you'll see Smiley, second from left, standing with a partisan uh, um, a girl holding uh, a submachine gun, and that's uh, Billy McLean, uh, second from, um, from, from the right. Now, why go to Albania? Well, initially, McLean had actually, um, who was uh, the, the head of the mission, called the Consensus Mission, and the actual spelling of uh, misspelling was uh, deliberate. The consensus mission was part of the wider British effort in the Balkans to disrupt uh, Axis supply lines, first of all to the Middle East, later on to uh, Greece. Uh, the general headquarters in Cairo saw the SOE missions in Greece. There have already been several missions dropped into Greece and into Yugoslavia as absolutely crucial to disrupting Axis uh, supply lines. So Although SOE missions had been dropped, as I said, into Yugoslavia and into um, Greece, none at that point had been dropped into um, Albania. And, and McLean was very, very keen to see what was there and whether resistance could be raised. Now, they knew very little about resistance activities in Albania itself. They had some information that came from um, a, a wonderful old woman called Fanny Husluck, who was an anthropologist who had lived in um, Albania in the interwar period. Um, and equally, they knew of some resistance among what were known as the Zoggist or the Royalist uh, forces um, that had actually tried to fend off the Italian invasion back in, um, back, in, back in 1940. But they really had no real idea of the strength of, of, of resistance to the Axis, primarily the Italians, but later on uh, the Germans. So in April 1943, Smiley and McLean had parachuted uh, into northern uh, Greece, and from there, they literally walk into the unknown. There was no real reception committee. But over the next, um, over the next three, uh, four, four months, they begin to make contact with various uh, uh, resistance groups, various insurgent groups. And in essence, these can be boiled down into three. The Royalists, the so-called Zoggists, named after King Zog, who were primarily located in the northern half of um, Albania. The uh, what's called the Balikombita or the Balkon, they were Republicans. Uh, they were anti-Royalists, but they were also anti-communists. And in mainly in the south of the country, in the central belt of the country, you had the uh, communist partisans, ultimately led by um, Enver Hoxha. What the first consensus mission manages to do is to set up a training base in uh, an area called uh, Biha and begin the process of trying to train and bring together the various resistance groups. The problem, of course, is they all dislike each other intensely and indeed hate each other. Um, in, uh, intensely. And McLean actually saw the mission as much as a diplomatic mission, as a military mission. Smiley very much saw it as a military mission, just trying to get the various resistance groups to cut line, German lines of communication and to take the war to the Allies. And it's in this first consensus mis mission um, in uh, June of uh, 1943 that Smiley wins a military cross for leading an ambush um, when he led uh, members of the Balkan or the Ballet Compitar on an ambush of, uh, uh, of Germans, uh, a German convoy, um, but was disgusted in many ways by how many of the Balkan actually ran away when the shooting actually started. Um, and indeed, he actually had a very low opinion of most of the guerrilla groups that he actually sort of came across. He found that it was very difficult to actually uh, get anybody to, 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 to sometimes concentrate on fighting what they saw as the main enemy, the Italians and the Germans, because they was much preparing to fight other groups as part of a growing civil war between these three main factions them, themselves. Um, by November of 1943, 
it's decided that the consensus mission should be withdrawn and a larger mission uh, take its uh, place. And in many respects, I think McLean and Smiley were glad uh, to leave. They didn't like the inflated size of this um, new mission. And uh, when they were evacuated, by this time, the war had moved to um, Italy. They were debriefed in Italy. They went back to Cairo, where, to be perfectly blunt, they had a, a very nice time. That if, you have, uh, if you're if you interested in this particular period, there's a very good book by Artemis Cooper um, called Cairo, in which he outlines the kind of life that McLean Smiley, the travel writer Patrick Lee Fermer, who was also in SOE and several others, were living in a villa called um, Tara. Smiley was then called back to, uh, to England. This was the first time he'd been back to uh, Britain in about five uh, years. Um, but um, as soon as he gets there, um, there's news that the Germans and the Italians have overrun the main um, SOE camp um, and the main SOE mission that had replaced them in Albania. And they're uh, called back and dropped back in as a second consensus mission in 1944. And this time they're accompanied by a very, very youthful Julian Amory. Now, Julian Amory knew the Balkans very well. He had served in the British Embassy in Belgrade um, in uh, 1940 and had tried to set up uh, resistance organizations while serving um, with Section D of, of MI6, which later became part of the SOE. And that's a, a picture in the center of Julian um, um, Amory. Uh, again, Smiley saw the mission, the consensus mission, as one being primarily determined by the need to bring the war to the enemy. But equally, McLean and um, Julian Amory very much saw diplomacy as being as important to this mission. And that was trying to get the various guerrilla groups to actually uh, work together to defeat um, um, the Germans and to um, not so much defeat the Germans, but to cut their lines of communication as the war swung in the Allies' way. And for the Allies in particular, it was important to keep the pressure on in the Balkans because it kept the Germans and indeed the Italians guessing about where the main Allied uh, thrust was going to be in Southern um, Europe. But what was clear was that um, the consensus mission was facing uh, what was by now quite an open civil war between the various factions. And in particular, uh, Amory McLean's um, sympathies lay with the Zoggis, with the Royalists. The Royalists were led by a former policeman of, of, of the Royal Guard called Abbas Kupi, but trying to get Abbas Kupi to actually uh, engage in active operations against the Germans, something which they felt would then release more British aid for the Royalists and secure Albania, therefore, with a Royalist government that would be pro-British, was something that proved extremely difficult to do. And indeed, other SOE missions um, actually felt that the partisans were actually um, uh, more effective in taking the war to the Germans. And there was this difference of opinion between various SOE missions who were reporting back to SOE headquarters. By this time, uh, SOE headquarters had uh, located to um, Bari. Um, very briefly, um, Smiley wins a second military cross in an, in an operation in which he blows up one of the main strategic bridges in um, uh, in Albania. And this was this, this operation was as much to demonstrate to SOE headquarters that the Zoggis could be reliable allies and therefore the British should actually supply the Zoggis with more arms, more ammunition. Um, this didn't happen. I, the decision had already been taken really by uh, um, the SOE headquarters in Bari and indeed the general headquarters that actually the most effective fighting force in Albania was actually the uh, partisans. And in this, I think the partisans were, were, were probably helped by favorable reports from the field from other SOE officers, notably a chap called um, Alan Palmer. But equally, there was this sense that some of the staff of SOE Bari were communist sympathizers or, or fellow travelers, and they had deliberately interfered with signals coming from the consensus mission, which actually highlighted the effectiveness of some of the operations of both the Bali Combutar and the Zoggist in particular. But by no November 1944, it's clear that the um, Zoggist, uh, the, uh, the communists, the partisans led by Emperor Hodja are in the uh, ascendant. And it's with a sense of despair and in some ways dismay 
over British policy that eventually the consensus mission is withdrawn in November of 1944. Now at this point, Smiley had really had um, enough of um, irregular warfare, not so much in terms of taking the war to the enemy, but the politics actually behind it. And he'd certainly felt that the Zoggis had been betrayed by British policy and that the British had needed to take a far wider view of what was likely to happen in Albania after the war. And effectively, both McLean and Amory, and certainly Smiley felt that the British policy had in effectively handed Albania over to the communists purely for short-term strategic expediency. So what did Smiley then do next? Well, he had hoped to rejoin his uh, regiment, which by now was part of the uh, uh, Allied forces moving through Belgium and later Holland. But in Cairo, on his on his way back to um, on his way back to uh, London, ostensibly on his way back to uh, London, he bumped into an old Thai friend of of, of his, a man called Prince Subasvasti, otherwise known as Chin. And he persuaded him to join an SOE mission through Force 136, that was the cover name for the SOE mission, to go to uh, Thailand or uh, Siam. And this is what Smiley eventually um, does. He has a brief trip back to the um, United Kingdom. He therefore quickly goes through a jungle training course in, um, uh, uh, in Ceylon, or now known of course as Sri Lanka. And then he's dropped as part of the so-called FELT mission into Northeast Thailand to work with the uh, free uh, Thai movement and to prepare them as an insurrectionary force to uh, confront the um, uh, Japanese. Um, there's a wider uh, issue here to do with UK uh, US uh, rivalry um, at the time. Clearly the British mission very much saw uh, its, its role, not just in terms of, of defeating um, the uh, Japanese, but equally of securing British interests and, and particularly British interests close to the border uh, with uh, Malaysia. Whereas for the Americans, very much uh, beholden to the sort of the anti-colonial message that one finds um, in the Atlantic Charter that had been uh, agreed between Roosevelt and Churchill, they actually wanted to see a decline and indeed push back against any British attempt to uh, re-establish their colonial interests. Um, Smiley um, leads this mission in a vast area which borders the, the Mekong uh, River and French Indochina to um, the um, east. Um, he tours his area, he, 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 he begins of training uh, some of the free Thai guerrillas, but equally what he's looking to do is to establish a whole series of airfields where when the time comes, resupply operations and drops and so forth can be brought to uh, the Thais. Um, one of the things they feared the most, however, was to be caught by the Japanese secret uh, police. And uh, what happens is uh, that um, in one of these um, camps, he hears, he hears news that the uh, Japanese a secret police, the Kemper Thai, are close by. And he'd been equipped with a, a briefcase which was designed to incinerate documents, if secret documents, if he was close to capture or indeed could be used as a booby trap. And while stuffing documents in this briefcase, hearing that the Japanese were close by, this briefcase uh, with, with, with had a small thermite charge in it, detonated prematurely. And he suffered first degree burns on his uh, arms, third degree burns on his chest and his face. He was very seriously ill and needed to be evacuated immediately. Uh, it turns out there wasn't a Japanese force nearby, but he was now facing uh, the, the issue of being in extreme pain, in extreme danger with no easy means of, uh, of, of being evacuated. And indeed, the pain was such at one time, I mean, maggots had got into his wounds and were eating his, his, his flesh. Um, he was in such extreme pain, they had a little morphine, he had actually smoked an opium pipe to try to, to, to dull the pain, um, that, his, um, that he did try to reach for his own revolver and to kill himself. Now, this was seen by his signaller who, um, who uh, removed the pistol from his reach. And through gently rubbing coconut oil into the wounds, they managed to lessen the pain and eventually messages were sent back to India and he was evacuated, eventually evacuated uh, through a series of flights back to India. In India, he recuperates 
quite miraculously in many ways, given the severity um, of his wounds. Sorry, I should have, uh, this is a picture of him in the Dakota on the way back and you can see the bandages wrapped around his arms uh, and his hands. And then he's taken back uh, to um, um, uh, 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 Thailand um, at the very end of the war, just before the Japanese surrender and in time to oversee the liberation of a prisoner of war camp in the town of um, Ubon. And I think it's worth mentioning um, here that uh, the camp that he liberated was commanded by a man called Colonel Tuzi, written, but written about in a very, very good by the uh, author Julie Summers. And um, he always felt that, the, that, that uh, Tuzi was one of the finest men that he met during the war because through his leadership, he had managed to keep most of his troops or many of his troops alive in the most appalling conditions and privations that they had suffered under the, the Japanese. And yet Tuzi was the character on which the, 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 the character of Colonel Nicholson in Bridge on the River Choir was actually based. And Smiley always felt that this, this had been a great injustice to a very, very brave man. Nonetheless, uh, in Thailand, he's, he's promoted in the field to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and begins to take the uh, surrender of Japanese uh, soldiers. And the picture you'll see on the right is of Smiley in a bush hat, accompanied by a Dutch officer, taking the particulars of uh, Japanese uh, officers many of whom were later tried for uh, war crimes and some were actually um, executed. He later goes on to uh, support um, the French missions that had been parachuted back into um, uh, Thailand, across the Mekong Delta to try to reestablish uh, French rule um, in what became uh, Laos. And again, it's worth uh, noting that he was and should have been decorated for bravery in rescuing French hostages, many of them who had already been held by the um, uh, by the Japanese, and now were uh, being held by what became the Viet Minh later on the um, Viet the, the Viet Cong, and through his own personal leadership and bravery, leading Force One Three Six officers as well as some French officers, he was able to liberate some of these. Um, French uh, host hostages. Again, British policy comes up against the interests of American policy, uh, very much of this whole issue of uh, decolonization. And one of the French uh, officers, a man called Klotz, is actually shot by the Viet Minh in front of OSS officers. This was the forerunner of the CIA without the actual Americans intervening to actually stop this from happening. And this again had a marked effect on Smiley. And he later mentioned to me that he always had a certain distrust of American foreign policy. Now his mission comes to um, an end in November of 1945, the war, the war is over. And now he, um, um, he goes back to, um, to, to England where he, uh, he had never been to Staff College. So he uh, goes to, uh, to, to, to Staff College, passes um, Staff College, um, and then is posted as assistant military attache to Poland. Um, he sees the rise of communism, communist um, um, uh, parties in, in Poland. He does engage in some spying in Poland itself, something that actually uh, causes uh, uh, a great deal of diplomatic ruffle between uh, the, the, the new Polish communist authorities and the British government. Um, he's actually arrested by uh, the Poles, he's thrown in jail and was actually uh, beaten up, much against any kind of diplomatic pr um, uh, protocols and eventually expelled from the country. At that point, um, he's then recruited into MI6. Some former SOE operatives, SOE had been wound up at the end of the war, but some former SOE operatives were actually recruited into MI6 simply because they had cer a certain skill set, notably in sabotage and subversion, that many operatives in MI6 simply didn't have. And then perhaps in the one, one of the more controversial episodes, he becomes part of an MI6 team that's sent to the Mediterranean in the summer of 19. Uh, 47 to sabotage Jewish refugee ships. This is something Smiley always remained very sensitive um, about. But in essence, the embarrassed team 
um, disguised as cigarette smugglers. And the photograph that you see on the left hand side is, is, is Smiley on one of the yachts that they were using to track Jewish refugee ships in the Mediterranean. But the idea was to actually get to some of these refugee ships and to actually disable them, to damage them in harbors, mainly in the Italian ports of Genoa and Venice before they could set sail with, Jif with Jewish refugees who were then trying to run the uh, Palestine, uh, the, the Royal Naval blockade of uh, Palestine. Um, again, Smiley was very, very clear that the orders were to sabotage the ships in harbor before they could be loaded because later on there were accusations that actually the idea was actually to put limpet mines on these ships and sink them at sea. That was actually never the case. The idea was actually to disable them um, in port. After his operations with Operation Embarrass uh, in the Mediterranean, he then goes back to his regiment as second in command in Germany. This is in 1948, 1949. Um, but um, he finds being second in command a very boring job. So when a former colleague of his who he knew know him, who he'd first met in Poland, a, a chap called uh, uh, Perkins, uh, came along and said, we have another job for you. Would you be interested? He jumped at, at the, the, the chance. And this job was to train Albanian exiles in a fort called Fort Benjema in uh, Malta in the arts of guerrilla warfare and insurgency, and then insert them back into Albania to overthrow the uh, regime of Enver Hoxha. Now, the architect behind much of this plan was actually Julian Amory, but it was actually something that was picked up on by the then Labour government, and particularly by the, by the Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, who saw an opportunity to roll back communism. And Amory was very much convinced that actually communism was ripe for rolling um, back. And Smiley was therefore recruited to help train up uh, Albanian exiles uh, in this fort in Malta, and then to be transported by sea back to Albania in the hope that they could set up some form of uh, networks, which would eventually uh, lead to the insurrection and the overthrow of um, Enver Hoxha. And the picture on the far right is Smiley with uh, his team, and the chap with the spectacles is a is 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 is, is a chap called uh, Zena, uh, Professor Zena, who during the who during the war he's a fluent Farsi speaker, fluent Persian speaker, uh, speaker who had been in MI6 during the war, and who had set up a series of clandestine MI6 networks in Persia, and the chap standing right behind Smiley was a chap called Gunnar Collins who had been his signaler in uh, Thailand, in Siam, who indeed had been the one who had largely saved his life when his uh, briefcase bomb had exploded prematurely. There is still considerable debate about uh, Operation Valuable uh, because it in essence failed. The uh, insurgents, many of those insurgents were, who were landed and this be, actually became a joint CIA MI6 operation. But many of the insurgents who were landed were quickly arrested or tracked down uh, and killed. And for a long time, nobody could really, really quite understand why this was the case until it was revealed in early the early 1960s um, with the defection of Kim Philby, that Kim, that Kim Philby had indeed exposed the operation to the Russians. The Russians had then uh, uh, told the Albanian Secret Service, the Sigurimi, um, and the Sigurimi then picked up these individuals. I think that's only part of the story. It has to be said that field security around many of the Albanian exiles was, was very poor. The, um, the place where they chose to land many of these Albanian exiles uh, was a place called Seaview, which had been used by SOE during the war to, to land and land supplies and take off and agents back to um, Italy. And indeed was actually being used by uh, the Greeks and the Yugoslavs for landing their own agents, their own teams into Albania. So the broader field security was, was not great. And we now know, of course, that the, Al the Albanian secret police, the Sigurimi, knew a great deal about the operations and the names of the people that were involved, um, even before many of them had actually landed. So it's not just the case, as some have suggested, that the whole operation was actually blown by Kim, by Kim Philby uh, before he, uh, before he uh, was uh, exposed in uh, the 1960s.
After Operation Valuable, Smiley goes back to uh, the regular army. He eventually becomes the commanding officer of the Blues. He rides uh, Queen's uh, escort for the coronation uh, in 1953. And he, he described this as being some of the proudest moments of his, um, of, 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 of his life. Um, but following um, his, um, but following his um, uh, time as commanding officer of uh, the Blues, he was at, at as it were, a, a crossroads and he had intended to actually retire from the army and take up farming uh, in Kenya. But before he does that, he's offered a chance to become British military attache in Stockholm, which he takes. And it's a position that um, he takes partly for financial reasons because the pay as, as a military attache, you get the pay of a diplomat rather than an army officer and the foreign office were far more generous in their allowances than, uh, than, uh, than the war office. Um, but nonetheless, by 1958, he's looking to um, uh, retire from the army and to start um, farming in Kenya. And he had bought a small farm uh, holding out there. That was until his old friend and SOE uh, colleague, Julian Amory comes on. Now, Julian Amory was the son-in-law of Harold Macmillan. He had risen quite quickly within uh, the Conservative Party. And by 1958, he was the Under Secretary of State um, for War. And um, things are stirring in the Arabian Peninsula, particularly in the Sultanate of Muscat and Oman. There's a growing rebellion, particularly in the north of the country, centered on the uh, Jebel uh, Akhtar region. And the Sultan, uh, Sultan Said bin Taimur, often seen as an antediluvian character, a venal character, was under great pressure from a uh, tribal rebellion, which had actually been, uh, which was actually led by the Imam, a chap called uh, Ghalib ben uh, Ali, supported by uh, uh, Sheikh Sulman bin Himya of the Beni Riyam. So there's a big tribal rebellion uh, brewing, but that's only part of the issue. The other part of the equation is that this tribal rebellion is being sponsored by the Saudis. And also it's, it's, it has been alleged enjoyed some material support from uh, Aramco. And again, it's this, this, this continued tension between British and American interests, this time um, in the Middle East itself. And in just outside of Nizwa, the Muscat and Oman field, uh, field force in 1957 had been routed at the hands of this um, tribal rebellion. And it was felt that British interests and Britain had been tied by a series of treaties to, uh, to, to, to the Sultanate were under threat, particularly the oil interests, uh, the petroleum development Oman had begun oil exploration and it was felt if there were oil there, it would be under threat from this growing rebellion. So there are a number of economic strategic reasons about why the British actually wanted to get involved. Amory goes out there, is dismayed at what he sees, the complete dissolution, if you like, of the um, of the Muscat and Oman um, film uh, field force. He rated the, the level of leadership of the officers, many of whom were so-called contract officers as poor and something needed to be done. So he approaches Smiley and says, would he prepare to be to go out and to reorganize uh, the field force and take the war to the um, and take and take the war to uh, the uh, Imam and to secure uh, the north of the country for the Sultan. Now it's often said that Smiley was an Arabist. He was not. I mean, he knew very, very little Arabic. His time in the Middle East had primarily been, if you like, fighting alongside um, uh, British uh, and Commonwealth um, forces. And he really didn't know much about Oman at all, but because he was being asked by Julian Amory, a close friend, um, he thought about it and decided to take um, the role. And he uh, arrives in um, Oman in the spring of 1958, and he is truly dismayed by what he sees, not just because the resources that he's been promised in London simply uh, are not there, but equally he finds access to the Sultan himself very difficult. 
the Sultan tends to spend, Sultan bin Taimur tended to spend most of his time in his palace in uh, Salala in, 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 in the Dofar region. And to get an audience with the Sultan was extremely difficult because he had a particular gatekeeper. And this was a chap called Patrick um, Waterfield who had actually been in command of the Muscat and Oman field force and acted as a kind of, of gatekeeper and eminence Greece to the Sultan um, himself. Nonetheless, uh, despite the uh, conditions, Smiley decides that he has to, as quickly as he possibly can, to reorganize the, uh, the, the field force. And at this point, it's given a new name, which is the SAF, the Sultan's um, Armed Forces. But even so, he's dismayed by two or three really key things. One is the lack of, of intelligence. There was virtually no indigenous uh, intelligence capability within the SAF. The one intelligence capability they had was, an, was a very, very capable officer, former RAF officer called Malcolm uh, Dennison. But the uh, Sultan had taken umbrage over a slight of Dennison's and had refused to actually deal with him. And yet um, um, Dennison approached intelligence and intelligence gathering amongst the tribes, which is the kind of intelligence that you really, really need to grapple with a tribal revolt from very much an anthropo uh, anthropologist's point of view. So what Smiley did was to make him head of uh, tribal uh, recruitment. And again, by calling him a tribal recruiting officer, it still allowed Denison to engage in intelligence gathering um, ac activity um, without necessarily the Sultan having to um, interfere. Second thing was the quality of many of the officers in the SAF. Many were actually contract officers who were beholden to the Sultan. And the orders that Smiley often gave, he found were negotiated rather than obeyed immediately. And this sort of irked him a great deal coming from an established professional military hierarchy where if you give an order, clearly it has to be uh, obeyed by your uh, subordinates. So he looked to bring in a higher quality of officer, either officers on secondment from the British Army or indeed the Royal Marines, um, or uh, just better quality contract officers. There were the other officer, however, he rated very highly was a chap called um, Colin Maxwell. I, I know he will have been known to uh, some of you. And through Maxwell, he began the process of retraining and reforming uh, the two uh, uh, key battalions or the two key regiments of the SAF, the Desert Regiment and the Northern Frontier um, um, Regiment. The third thing, however, he was promised resources which simply did not materialize. That's greater investment in things like um, art artillery, um, uh, sappers, uh, engineers, so on and, and so forth. And he often felt that his requests were being blocked by uh, both his immediate superior in uh, Bahrain, chap called Brigadier Tinker, and by Middle East Command, which by at that point was based um, in Aden. Smiley knew, however, he had to defeat the insurgency quickly, otherwise the consequences for the British position in Oman would have been disastrous. And he begins a grand tour of the Jebel Akhtar, the Jebel Akhtar region where most of the main insurgents were um, actually uh, based. And in total, the actual, he traveled the circumference of the Jebel Akhtar, a journey that took 900 uh, miles, speaking to many of the tribes, and here you see him sort of speaking with the uh, with with the uh, Wali of uh, Nizwa in a, in a so-called what he called a fuddle, an Arabic meal. And he began to get a sense of the scale of the task actually um, before him. He then approaches, he circumvents, if you like, the chain of command. He goes back to London and he speaks directly both to Julian Amory, but equally to Christopher Soames, the son-in-law of Winston Churchill. Uh, about actually getting the resources that he needs or what he thinks he needs to defeat the insurgency. Soames says he'll do what he, what, what he can, but this certainly um, irked some individuals in this chain of command that Smiley could actually call on favours in Whitehall um, rather than actually going through Tinker in Bahrain and Middle East Command in Aden. The resources that he eventually gets to defeat the insurgency on the, uh, on the Jebel Akhtar are really um, two uh, uh, squadrons of the SAS who are actually returning from um, uh, Malaya. And 
this was about as best it was going to get because the Foreign Office in particular didn't want a big noise. Another example of British colonialism, a heavy imperial footprint in the sand of the Middle East, um, just so soon after the, um, the Suez uh, crisis and the Suez affair of 1956. Moreover, um, in the summer of 19, um, uh, uh, 1959, there was going to be a big debate in the United Nations um, about uh, imperialism, colonialism in the Middle East. So the Foreign Office wanted a lightest footprint as possible. So Smiley is offered the use of two, eventually of two squadrons of um, SAS. Now the plan to take the Jebel is actually often put down to the commander of the SAS troops on the ground, Lieutenant Colonel Dean Drummond. And this is actually to deny the role that Smiley actually played. It was his overall plan and indeed, his own troops in the SAF who actually found the initial routes up to the Jebel uh, Akhtar, which they could use in order to establish a presence. And from that presence, eventually launch the uh, operation which secured the Jebel Akhtar in, 19, uh, in, in January of 1959 and saw the dispersal of that rebel movement. And indeed, in that Jebel Akhtar operation, which was brilliantly carried out by the SAS, there's no denying that, but equally supported by the, um, but equally supported by elements of the SAF. It was really Smiley's overall strategic grip and Smiley's control, which brought the British success. And this was recognized back in London by Julian Amory and others who wrote that this was well, one of the first great British successes um, um, in the Middle East. Now Smiley should have actually been given the DSO for his actions in Oman. And this was denied him. And it was denied him, he felt, precisely because he'd usurped the chain of command. Officially, it was denied him because it was said, and he was told, that he was actually fighting the, um, uh, the, the Sultan's enemies rather than the Queen's enemies. But it doesn't explain why so many awards, and rightly so, were given to uh, members of the um, SAS. And he was rather taken aback by the fact that there was no clasp and indeed no medal given to um, soldiers um, who had actually fought in that particular campaign. The gratitude of the Sultan uh, was, was also rather parsimonious. Um, he turned around and gave Smiley a coffee pot and he found out that that coffee pot had actually been made in London. And he thanked him with the words, well, thank you for winning uh, my war for me. So he actually felt uh, rather disgruntled in many ways by the gratitude both of people back in London uh, and certainly by Middle East Command and his, his superiors in, um, in, in, in Bahrain. Um, and that really soured, I think, the rest of his time in Oman, even though Oman in some respects was actually his greatest uh, military um, triumph. So, in 1961, although they wanted him to stay on for an, uh, an extra year, he decides to actually leave uh, the army. But by this time, he also um, has uh, decided that the life in Kenya was uh, not for him. Kenya was uh, about to achieve uh, independence, and he actually felt um, that uh, the cost of living in Kenya, and by this point he had um, he had, he, he had uh, I think it was five children, no, four, uh, yeah, five, I think five children, stepsons, stepdaughter, and, uh, and, and, and sons from his uh, marriage. The cost of actually um, air tickets from, from the UK to uh, Kenya was simply uh, prohibitive. So for a number of reasons, he decides to sell up his farm uh, in Kenya. He settles in a uh, castle on the Scottish borders, a place called uh, Branksholm, and looks for work. But there's very little work that he can actually do. He tries to set himself up as a mushroom farmer, but to be blunt, he had no sense of, of business, and he himself admitted that he was a, a failure at this endeavour. He uh, had a part-time job as a, a food guide, but it simply wasn't enough, as it were, to keep body and soul together. So in some respects, it was a relief when his old comrade in arms, Billy McLean, approaches him in June of 1963 and says, would he become a, uh, an advisor 
to the uh, royalist forces that were now battling um, a Republican regime in uh, Yemen. Most of you, of course, will know the background to the Yemen civil war, so I won't labor the point, but in essence, there was in 19, uh, in September of 1962, the old imamat uh, and, the, and the imam was uh, uh, overthrown in a Republican coup sponsored by the uh, Egyptians. The Saudis are very concerned because they see Nasser's intrigue uh, uh, in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, feel that, um, part of the wider Arab Cold War, the Egyptians are looking to uh, overthrow uh, monastic, uh, sorry, uh, monarchical rule, monastic rule, monarchical rule, and uh, look therefore to try to support um, royalist forces, as they were collectively known, mainly from the Zaidi uh, tribes in the north of the uh, country. And Smiley therefore becomes, in the first instance, a military advisor to the royalist forces, writing reports from the summer of 1963 to the Saudis on the basis of these reports, the Saudis would be supplying arms and equipment to, um, to the royalist forces. More broadly, however, um, we have to take into consideration the position of uh, the British. When the coup takes place in 1962, the Foreign Office advocate recognition of the new regime. They felt that any, any other course of action would be to, as it were, deny the tide of, of, of history. Um, and indeed, you know, Nasser at this point was very much um, in the ascendant. Arab nationalism was very much in the ascendant. And they felt by actually engaging with, um, with the Republican regime led by Brigadier As-Salal in, uh, in, in, in Sana'a, this would somehow appease As-Salal uh, undermine Yemeni claims to what was the Federation of South Arabia, this collection of the old aid and protectorates that the British were trying to cohere into a collective whole in order to ensure that their own military base in Aden was actually secure. And the Foreign Office felt this was the best thing to actually do, to recognize the regime itself. Now, this was opposed by what became known as the um, Aden Group. They felt that NASA would never be satisfied with this structure of the, of the Federation of South Arabia. And the Aden Group was led in parliament by Julian Amory and by Billy McLean, who by now was the um, MP for um, Inverness. And what Billy McLean did in, uh, 19, in 1962, knowing full well that the Foreign Office were advocating recognition, was to take a trip, and it was a trip sponsored by a very young King Hussein of um, Jordan throughout the Middle East, and then to drive from the border town of Bayhan through Yemen, through the royalist areas and into Najran in Saudi Arabia. And on the basis of this trip and the report that uh, McLean was able to present to um, cabinet, this went some way to persuading the uh, British government then under Harold Macmillan, not to offer a de jure recognition of the new regime itself. Now, this was opposed clearly by um, the Foreign Office, but they actually felt themselves to be at odds and often the poor relation in these Whitehall battles between, on the one hand, themselves, the Foreign Office who wanted to recognize and the Colonial Office and elements within the Ministry of Defense led by people like Peter Thornycroft, who was the Defense Minister, who wanted actually to uh, take, if you like, a more hardline view towards um, towards the Egyptian back government. What the British did was to launch a series of limited uh, clandestine operations to support tribes on the other side of the border, particularly the Murad tribe, who were uh, attacking Egyptian targets in and around the area of Taiz. But these operations actually were very, very limited and very, very carefully controlled. And Amory and uh, McLean in particular felt that more proactive action had to be uh, taken. And this is where they decided to try to set up what was what became known as the BMO, the British Mercenary Organization. What the BMO did was to recruit uh, former serving members of the SAS, but equally French mercenaries. And the idea was that these mercenaries would be uh, allocated to the various royal royalist fronts in, in the north of Yemen, where most of the, in the mountains of Yemen, where most of the Zaidi tribes were actually sort of concentrated. Um, and to uh, train these royalist tribesmen uh, 
in um, guerrilla warfare. And this is certainly something that in his various reports from 63, 64, Smiley continued to recommend. He told the Saudis, it's no good the royalist forces trying to attack head on in a conventional way. Um, Egyptian forces um, who were dug in in mountain um, redoubts. The better thing to do was to attack the line of communications so that ultimately these garrisons would wither on the vine. So what we see is the emergence of a British mercenary organization, which the British government know about, um, but, actually do, but, but actually don't formally um, endorse. By this time, Smiley has gone out to Yemen several times by 1964. Um, his, he, he does so under the cover of a journalist of the Daily Telegraph, although as he once mentioned to me, the Daily Telegraph never paid him for all the articles that he actually uh, wrote. He writes these various reports that go back to the Saudis and the Saudis start to use these reports, uh, both to supply arms and ammunition, but when necessary to put pressure upon the, uh, uh, the, the, the Imam, al Badr. And there's a picture of Smiley below with uh, al Badr uh, in, in the mountains um, near Kaulan, I think that picture um, was, was taken, but use those reports to try to, 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 to get the Imam to adopt a far more coherent uh, strategy in trying to defeat the Egyptian forces. Now, the problem that the, um, that the British mercenary organization as it emerged actually had were supply lines. Supply lines were mainly coming in at this point across the border from the Federation of South Arabia through Bekhan uh, in particular but they were open to interdiction from the um, Egyptians. So this led to a, one of the more controversial episodes of the whole operation in Oman, and that's the involvement of the um, Israelis. Um, Billy, Mc, uh, Billy McLean um, had a series of meetings with the Royalist Foreign Minister, a chap called Ahmed al-Shami, and it was decided to make an approach to the Israeli military attache in London, a man called Dan Hiram, in the winter of 1963. Series of meetings then uh, were arranged, which, in, which were held in uh, Julian Amory's house in Eaton Square. And eventually this leads to um, David Smiley, along with a chap in the center of the photograph that you see, a chap called Jim Johnson, who'd been a former commander of 21 SAS, making a series of trips over to Tel Aviv uh, to talk to the Israelis about creating an air bridge which, in which the Israelis would fly supplies, ammunition and so forth to various royalist fronts in uh, the mountains. There was a great deal of debate in Israel about this. I mean, some felt that it was far too uh, risky, but eventually it was felt that anything the Israelis could do to bleed the Egyptian army in Yemen, and by this time the Egyptians had around 40 to 50,000 troops in Yemen, was to Israel's benefit. So it was agreed, the Israelis agreed, to start what they called Operation Mango, a series of air supply drops that flew from Tel Aviv all the way down uh, the Red Sea, past the coast or along the coastline of Saudi Arabia and into the mountains. And in total, between 64 to 66, the Israelis, in essence, flew um, 14 uh, missions, uh, very, very risky missions, but nonetheless, no plane was ever lost um, on these missions. I've often been asked, did the Saudis know about what was taking place? And again, I asked Smiley this, and he, he was adamant that the Saudis never knew what was taking place. Other academics have produced research which suggests at least the, the head of Saudi military intelligence, Kamal Atam, uh, did know what was going on. And again, operating on the basis of my enemy's enemy is my friend, thought that the operations um, were worth their while. It gets to the point in 1965 with the Jeddah Agreement, where actually the Egyptians are looking for a way out. NASA is actually looking for um, a way out. And indeed, this comes on the heels of what was called the Wadi Humadat operation, when led by the chap in the orange turban, and this is Bernard Mills, who had served in the SAS, and I know is known to many of you uh, from the British Yemeni um, Society. Um, they inflicted a very heavy defeat at this strategic pass, the Wadi Humaydad, in which a large Egyptian force was uh, destroyed. And it really was, if you like, a moment of victory, because at that point, it was clear that, that the royalist tribes controlled land all the way from the border with Saudi Arabia, all the way down through Marib to the border 
um, with a federal, uh, with a federation of South Arabia. Nasser was, was, was looking for a way out. And at that point, um, 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 Bernard Mills made the point that, uh, uh, that, that defeat was snatched from the jaws of victory. Why? Because of the defense cuts uh, that were announced by the, then, by the Labour government under Harold Wilson and the announcement that Britain would actually be withdrawing from Aden, which had been the whole rationale for establishing the British mercenary organization in the first place. Smiley is appointed the uh, command of the British uh, mercenary organization in 65, but it's quite clear that he, he was doing this really on a part-time basis, spending about a, a month, six weeks, visiting Yemen, visiting the various uh, uh, mercenary uh, advisors with the royalist France, then going back to um, going back to England. But um, it was quite clear by this point that the Saudis were also beginning to cast their eye on the wider politics of Yemen, and in particular support for something called the Third Force. And these were re Republican politicians who were going who were growing increasingly um, uh, uh, who were uh, uh, increasingly disillusioned with the leadership of Brigadier as Salal, and the Saudis felt that they could probably work with them. And it was said that actually one of the reasons why the Saudis uh, agreed to the Wadi Humadad operation because, be, was because they actually felt it would lead to a royalist defeat, humiliate the Imam, and allow the Saudis the opportunity to then support this third force. It didn't happen, but it was quite clear to uh, uh, McLean, to Amory, and to Smiley that the Saudi support for the royalists was, was increasingly becoming half-hearted. And equally, there were divisions of opinion within the British military uh, organization itself, amongst the mercenaries themselves. Um, um, Jim Johnson had a rather direct approach towards the Saudis, which uh, riled the Saudis and certainly annoyed Billy McLean, who felt that he should have been the and he was the person who should be dealing with the Saudis. The issue, the issue here was that the Saudis often proved slow payers to the mercenary organization. So really what we see from 66 to 68 is this mercenary organization still continuing to advise the royalist guerrillas, but, but, be, but becoming less and less, if you like, effective to the point where most of them were pulled out by 1968, 1969, and certainly, uh, the last of Smiley's 14 trips to Yemen comes in, uh, in, in, in the summer of 1968. After that, he decides with his earnings that he, he which he certainly did earn from the Saudis, to retire to Spain. He spends the next 20 years uh, in Spain. He, um, um, he uh, writes his, uh, his memoirs, his time in Albania, later his time uh, in, in Arabia as well, although he's very circumspect in what he says. Um, after 20 years, he then returns to England, first to live in Somerset and later to retire finally to his flat um, in, um, in Earl's Court. Um, how to really to summarize um, his, his life? Certainly he was an incredibly brave man. I think he was also an incredibly loyal man. I mean, even when it's quite clear in, uh, in Yemen, for example, that he was really fighting for a lost cause out of loyalty to both Julian Amory and Billy McLean, but equally to his Saudi paymasters, he uh, stays on to see it through to the very bitter end. Whether he actually should have accepted the assignment in the first place, well, that's open to debate. But what I think is clear is that in the case of the Yemen, at least, it sets, if you like, the, the groundwork, the ball rolling for what later became known as private military organizations, mercenaries, if you like, by any other name, that came to dominate so much of what we understand of conflict um, in, in, in the 21st uh, century, be it from protecting aid convoys to actual sort of com combat operations. Um, again, I start, go back to what I said at the very beginning. Um, Alan Hare once noted, again, a former colleague of his from SOE, who he served with in Albania, that he actually had no imagination. I think Smiley had plenty of imagination. Um, he was an incredibly loyal in, individual, um, quite willing to lead from the front where others perhaps in similar circumstances would uh, not have done. And in many respects, uh, he, he developed, as it were, a prototype 
for the type of warfare, hybrid warfare, if you like, which we see across so much of the world today. Okay, I best leave it there, James, and I'll hand back to you. No, well, that's uh, absolutely fascinating, Clive. Oh, my goodness, what a what a tour de force over uh, over the the um, the life of uh, David Smiley. Um, you know, as we're Yemen and Omani people are interested in those those two countries, I think it'd be good to perhaps divert the uh, or focus the Q and A on 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 those two areas. Uh, but I think you're, what you're saying about Albania and so on was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, maybe I can just kick off myself because um, uh, you have alluded at a couple of points to what might be motivating uh, David Smiley to lead this really quite extraordinary life and, and the risks he took, personal risks he took. But what was really motivating him? What, uh, what was driving him? Was there uh, any question of ideology? You mentioned loyalty, but then that was in the context of loyalty to individuals more than loyalty to the Queen, if you like. What, what was really driving uh, this, this extraordinary energy that he had um, and putting his skills in, uh, in, in counterinsurgency and so on into, into operation? I think it's quite simple, really. Um, I think it's loyalty to his country. I mean, he was very much a, a patriot. I mean, he wasn't in some, he wasn't ideological. I think he was a conservative um, through instinct rather than through sort of, you know, um, thought through political deliberation. Um, I mean, there's this one episode, if I can just mention Albania, where he's engaged in, in a conversation with uh, Enver Hoxha. And Enver Hoxha was sort of, sort of waxing lyrical about how he'd like to see the whole world turn communist and, and Smiley turned around to him and said, yes, I'd like to see the, the world turn red as well, but not the red that you're thinking of. In other words, the old red or the old red reddish pink that used to uh, color maps of, of, of the British empire. And I think he was very much a man driven by becoming involved in actions if they were in the interests of Britain. Now, when it comes to Yemen, for example, I mean, it was quite clear that what the British mercenary organization was doing was, a, was against the advice. I mean, he was actually advised initially by MI6 not to actually become involved. There's a, there's a letter from uh, John Bruce Lockhart, who was then the director of Middle East operations. He met Smiley and Whites in, um, in London and actually said, you know, don't, don't do this, don't get involved. You know, that the policy of the British government is not to get involved. Um, but ultimately, I think that, you know, he, he felt that what he was doing was in Britain's uh, interest. And he once turned around to me and he actually said, you know, the Foreign Office, they're a very bad regiment. <laughs> right. Well, look, there's a few questions coming up. Um, I, I think to save time, I'll just I'll just read them because it is getting a bit late. Um, okay. There's one from Tom Walsh. Uh, Over the span of British engagement with the Middle East, how much of a priority has Yemen been to the UK? especially in comparison to other states that may have been more of an obvious rational interest. Right, that brings us to date, I guess, but can you, uh, and I guess we're all wondering, uh, the Saudis, backed by Britain to some extent, were uh, supporting the Zaidi tribes in North Yemen back in the, in the 60s, but now, of course, it's the opposite. I mean, uh, maybe you can combine those two, that comment and, and Tom Walsh's question there. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, this is taking up to, to, to the present time. And we know there have been obviously British military advisors, notably actually from the SAS, who um, I think in around two, they, 2007, 2008, were part of various military training teams um, in uh, Sanaa, mainly aimed, I, I, I assume, at uh, countering um, El Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. We also know, of course, that there were Royal Naval training teams uh, helping to um, um, hel helping the, the the Yemeni Coast Guard uh, and, and and the Yemeni Navy in anti smuggling operations and so on and so forth. So I think, in terms of um, British interests, you know, Yemen has continued to be a British interest. I think partly, of course, it's it's still it's still the case. It's it's the, it's the actual strategic. Um, location of, of Yemen at the end, at the, at the foot of the Red Sea. Um, so um, I also think it's, it's part and parcel of, of Britain's alliance with, um, with, with, with the United States. And of course, we also know that um, RAF officers have been part of the targeting process for um, Saudi air operations into Yemen uh, itself. So clearly there are British interests, but I think those interests are, are certainly shifted and certainly changed 
from the 1960s, when of course the main British interest was, was the protection of the Aden base and power projection um, across the region to protect its oil interests. Yes, thank you. Um, there's one here that's more oriented towards what you were saying about uh, what was happening in Oman uh, from Gabby. The Aramco connection to Saudi sponsorship of the rebellion is very interesting. Please elaborate. Uh, thank you for so much for this wonderful talk. Can you elaborate a bit on that? I mean, that's, that seems a very interesting uh, period of, of history where British and Saudi interests were less aligned. I kind of skipped over I skipped over this, but in essence, there was something called the Omani Rebel Army. Well, that's what it was actually called in, in British documents, the Omani Rebel Army. And in essence, these were uh, um, Omani laborers who, dare I say, had, had left the, um, the, the, the Sultanate and had gone to work in the oil industries in, in Iraq, Kuwait and other such places. But they'd come under, if you like, the, um, the influence of, of Arab nationalism, and indeed of nationalism in Iraq and so on and so forth. And many of these were, 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 were trained by the Saudis in uh, camps which were adjacent to um, uh, Aramco um, uh, uh, facilities, notably around um, Dahran in uh, Saudi Arabia. And they were uh, given um, plastic mines, many of the, you know, American plastic mines. And uh, it, was, it was said by uh, Smiley, and indeed, if you look at some of the documents in the National Archives from uh, what were called DIOs, Desert Intelligence Officers, that they could actually trace the, um, um, these, the, these mines back to Aramco stations where they had been given um, to Aramco employees as part of the American military missions to Saudi Arabia. And these plastic mines were then given to the ORA members and they used them to sort of mine the, the key communication routes in Oman uh, itself. In fact, one of Somali's main tasks, particularly after the Jebel Akhtar uh, campaign, was to actually set up an, various intelligence networks in, in what was then the Trucial States, later became the United Arab Emirates in Qatar in which they would actually try to bribe individuals to actually hand over these particular mines. And indeed, the, the main weapon of choice in all of this was, was, was money. The MI6 station chief at the time in Bahrain, who Smiley worked very, very closely with, was a chap called Norman Derbyshire, who many of people may know was uh, heavily involved in the coup of 1953, which over, overthrew Mossadegh. But in essence, that was how they actually conducted the built up this intelligence network. It was through trying to use bribes um, in the various um, tribal areas to get people to hand over these, these so-called plastic mines, which were very deadly. They were the IEDs really at their time. No, well, fantastic. I can't see that many questions coming up, but I've got one that I'm sure is on everyone's mind, which is, uh, you mentioned that uh, Smiley was not an Arabist, um, unlike, uh, there's obviously some parallels of people like T. Lawrence and so on who did uh, speak Arabic, but um, yet you had pictures of him speaking to the tribes, I think in Oman, yeah. you know, speaking to Al Badr and so on. How, how did he actually communicate? How did you strike up a rapport with people from uh, what was in those days and still is in such a different culture? Yeah. I mean, he was, um, you know, he was uh, accompanied by people like uh, the uh, Sultan's, uh, Sultan bin Taimur's um, um, cousin Tariq who spoke um, good English. Um, he also could rely on the, um, uh, the support of people like Malcolm Dennison, who was a fluent Arabic speaker. Um, uh, and equally within the SAF, he, he eventually managed to get individuals into the SAF who also uh, spoke Arabic. He also developed you know, some Arabic of, of himself, you know, the, the very sort of uh, pleasantries. Um, so that's actually how he, how, 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 how he managed to uh, communicate most of the time. He had people around him who clearly could speak English and communicate in Arabic at the same time. Right, right. I think we better just take one last question. Uh, this is one from Jill Blunden. Clive, what can we learn from Smiley's ways of, and embracing of unconventionality of relevance to contemporary operations? Is his approach still relevant? I think it is in the sense, I, I think in, in, you know, throughout his life, either in Albania, or indeed later on in Oman and later in Yemen, um, you have to also understand the limitations of the tribes. You actually have to work with the grain rather than uh, against it. And I think you know, what he was very, very clear, um, insurgents, guerrillas, 
um, have to play to their strengths. They're not regular soldiers. They're not they're not disciplined soldiers. And you have to get them to do what perhaps naturally comes easy to them. And in his case, it was very much this idea of trying to get them to you know cut lines of communication. At the same time, there is an element here where Smiley learned over time that you also have to be the diplomat. Diplomacy didn't come easy to him when he was in Al Albania. And very much he saw his mission in Albania as a, as a military mission. But equally, it's quite clear that there was a tribal element, an ideological element to that mission itself, which you know, clearly um, McLean and um, Amory were very heavily involved in. And I think this is ultimately something that he learned over time, even though it was often frustrating and often um, some of the, the, the military leaders, particularly in Yemen, simply wouldn't take his advice. But you have to understand the potential, but also the actual limitations of the people with which you're, you're working with. And you can't impose agendas upon them. And I think that, that's, that, that, that's crucial. Um, and I think that's a lesson that he's, he, he certainly you know, brings to the fore through his, through his life. Yes, and that feels like a very uh, currently relevant lesson too. <clears throat> there are some questions still coming in, but um, it's now half past seven. So I do suggest that we, we wrap up. You know, it's been an absolute tour de force. Clive, you've, you've really covered an enormous amount of ground with uh, an absolutely fascinating period. I think we all emerge wiser, but perhaps also <laughs> slightly disturbed um, by the clandestine worlds that you've described and the influence of individuals, um, particular MPs and so on, um, uh, and a world that's generally opaque to our, to our gaze. And you've managed to shine your torch into those, those obscure corners. So thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, we will try and put the, uh, the recording of this on the website. Um, and in the meantime, anyone interested in joining the British Yemeni Society or indeed the anglo Mani Society, uh, please do so through our respective websites. Uh, we have a program of events coming up, which you will then have access to. So thank you so much, Clive. And uh, it's been an absolutely fascinating evening. Okay, Th thank you very much indeed. Good night. Thank you.